All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our talk about Gen 3 and advancing biomedical research with an open source and cloud native platform. My name is Jawad Qureshi. Uh, I'm the lead platform engineer at CTDS uh, at UChicago. And I'm Colin Griffin. I'm a founder and chief engineer at Crumware. Uh, we develop cloud native technologies. Uh, I'm a contributing member of TAG App Delivery and the Platforms Working Group. All right, a little bit about the agenda for this presentation. Uh, we'll go quickly uh, over an intro where I'll introduce CTDS and what we do. Uh, we'll talk about biomedical research, give a little bit of background, and especially in the cloud. Then we'll go over Gen3, which is the platform that we're building to conduct research in the cloud. Um, and just a little bit of our cloud native and Kubernetes journey. Uh, quick plug for Crumware. Um, we're software developers that specialize uh, in cloud native software solutions. Uh, we are application developers that are actively practicing uh, platform engineering practices. And we support software vendors and their end users and help build uh, shippable software products. And CTDS, which is Center for Translational Data Science. So as I mentioned, we're the builders and maintainers of Gen3. Uh, we're part of the Biological Science Division at University of Chicago. Uh, our founder and director is Dr. Robert Grossman, and he's a top leader for data sharing and data commons in particular. Uh, yeah. The CTDS vision is a world which researchers have ready access to the data needed and the tools required to make data-driven discoveries. And our mission is basically to apply data science in a translational way and apply it to problems in biology, medicine, healthcare, and the environment. A little bit more about our center. So it's effectively split in half, where half of our center is working on something called the Genomic Data Commons. That's a research platform uh, developed with National Cancer Institute, uh, and it's used by about 100,000 researchers worldwide. It makes 6.7 petabytes of harmonized data available for about 89,000 patients. Um, GDC runs exclusively in the uh, UChicago data centers, uh, but it is that technology, the pioneering technology to build data commons that we standardized and made open source and cloud native that turned into Gen3. And Gen3 today hosts about 2 million different total subjects. Uh, we have about 93 million files, and that totals to about 22 and a half petabyte in total file size. And some more impressive stats can be found at stats.gen3.org. So let's talk about biomedical research and especially in the cloud. Uh, so the traditional approach to doing bi biomedical research is you uh, make up a data repository from all of the different research projects. And it's a centralized repository with some sort of governing body. And then you have different research institutions that basically copy the data from that repository into isolated uh, compute environment. Uh, as you saw, the numbers for Gen3 and GDC, and especially in genomic research, data can grow in size, and copying that amount of data can get really expensive, like, uh, and, uh, yeah. You also get limited access, because only a few researchers will have direct access to that repository uh, and can uh, utilize that data. Uh, and it's not really data sharing, it's data copying. And security as well becomes a thing that each individual research institution uh, has to take care of and research is essentially done in isolation, uh, and it's hard to reproduce, and we're all familiar with the term, works on my machine, just apply that to research. So the cloud for biomedical research is a great thing. Like, you can get immediate access to large data set mounted in cloud compute environments. You can have elastic compute, so you can scale up and down and only pay for what you use. Uh, you can have centralized security, which I think is way more secure than uh, isolated secure uh, uh, environments. And then also you can have containerized research environments. You can have reproducible research. You can have research done like in a portable way. Uh, you can have isolation and uh, yeah. Essentially it uh, enhances the collaboration. But cloud can be a complex topic. Like let's say you never worked in the cloud. Where do you even start as a researcher? There's a steep learning curve that we all probably know when you first start with cloud. Uh, like how do you arrange enough compute resources for your needs? How do you, uh, let's say you get your data in the cloud. How do you make that data findable? Uh, how do you do access control? And how do you get the tools that you want to use for research into those compute resources? Um, and most importantly, how do you do all of that securely? That is where Gen3 comes in into the picture. Uh, so Gen3 is an open source data platform for building data commons and data ecosystems. I'll get back to a little bit what those are. But the goal of it is essentially to abstract away the cloud complexities for the re researchers, but also to bring the open source culture to research. 
Gen3 is built on cloud-native principles and technologies, such as Kubernetes, uh, also built with FAIR principles at its core. So all research and data that is being conducted on uh, Gen3 needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, Gen3 is also designed to be lightweight enough to run on your laptop, but in uh, certain use cases, you can also scale up to thousands of nodes. So I mentioned Gen3 is a platform for spinning up data commons. So data commons, the definition of them is that it's a shared virtual space designed to co-locate data, storage, and compute infrastructure, and a suite of interoperable tools. So you get basically a uh, rich platform that you can work with uh, diverse or rich data sets and uh, do scientific investigation collaboratively. So with Gen3, you deploy it, you get a uh, cloud-based research platform, with, uh, and you can get your data in there. You have all your uh, favorite containerized research tools and all the services to protect, protect that in a single platform. Uh, Gen3 provides a robust user authentication and authorization, uh, so you can do controlled access to data hosted in Gen3. Uh, we support a variety of different data types um, and provide a, a suite of data management tools. So a few highlights. Gen3 is built on top of powerful and open APIs. Uh, we provide an authentication and authorization boundary built on top of OpenID Connect, so we can uh, integrate with a variety of different identity, identity providers. Uh, the Gen3 APIs provide multiple ways of finding your data or doing data search, and also uh, a suite of data management tools, as I mentioned. So you can do data access control, data ingestion, data export, but also do data quality control against a set data model. Uh, we also have Data Portal, which like, lets you browse and explore the data that you host in Gen3. And Gen3 workspaces are containerized uh, data analysis environments, such as Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and then we also have an SDK for Python if you want to build on top of Gen3. And I just want to mention that we're FedRAMP certified for several of our Gen3 deployments, which essentially just means that we have to do FIPS everywhere. Um, we support ingestion of virtually any sort of data, which opens up, up uh, a variety of different use cases uh, that we're doing today. So that can be genomic research or DNA research or cancer research with large oncology data sets. You can do research on biomedical imaging, such as MRIs or CT scans. We're doing environmental studies where you can aggregate data for climate research or conservation efforts or pollution controls and many, many more. Uh, these are some Gen3 instances. So we are doing genomic research for the VA. We have Biodata Catalyst, which uh, basically aggregates and shares human disease data. We have the uh, Cancer Research Data Commons, which is, which is just using a subset of the Gen3 services to support their environments. We've got the Medric environment, which does biomedical imaging, and they're trying to build like AI stuff on top of medical imaging. We have Kids First, which uh, focuses on uh, children with cancer and structural birth defects, and Blood Pack, which focuses on liquid biopsy for oncology uh, and cancer treatments. Time. Yeah, and there are many more on uh, gen3.org slash powered by gen3. So we have a lot of different Gen3 data commons, and the next evolution of Gen3 is to build like an inter, uh, ecosystem that can interconnect all of these different uh, data commons, which turns into like a federated research platform that is unified by the framework services that provide authentication and authorization, uh, indexing and search and access to uh, the data, and also the metadata services. Uh, when you connect all of these different data commons together, you can still have all of these data resources interoperable, uh, like uh, operable, operate um, separately, and auth authorization to each data hosted by these commons are still controlled by themselves. Uh, the ecosystems can also integrate with any sort of repository that is FAIR compatible. Biomedical Research Hub is an instance of the Gen3 data ecosystem where we take data from 11 different data commons and federate them uh, as a uh, patient data research platform. Uh, it also was recently nominated as a driver project for the GA4G8, which is a global alliance for genomics and health. And there, another instance of the Gen3 data ecosystem is the NIH HEAL initiative. Um, the NIH HEAL uh, ecosystem is basically uh, a trans-NIH effort to address the national opioid crisis. Uh, the, the goal of the uh, HEAL project is to get all of the research that is produced by this project to be uh, readily available for healthcare providers and policymakers. Um, 
one thing that is really cool by, the, uh, by this HEAL project is that the, there is a data sharing policy that any research or data produced by this effort needs to be uh, fair compatible. So all of the data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So, and that's why it's built on top of the Gen3 data ecosystems. But that has a certain impact on research institutions. Now they either need to build APIs or product around their data to make their research fair, or they can go the easy option and host Gen3. Uh, which essentially means that they now need to uh, start managing Kubernetes and uh, cloud native environments. So Gen3, in essence, is serving as a catalyst or a gateway drug for these institutions to <laughs> embrace Kubernetes. And that's how Crumb got involved. Yeah, so uh, we are actually adopters and end users of the Gen3 platform. Uh, we're supporting uh, Wake Forest University uh, and a program there called Empower. Uh, Empower means the integrative management of chronic pain and OUD for whole recovery. Uh, this is powered by an NIH grant as well, uh, sponsored by uh, Dr. Meredith Adams. Shout out to her. She's awesome and is in Chicago somewhere at another conference. Um, uh, the basic situation was uh, Wake Forest needed a data commons, but did not have uh, Kubernetes expertise, couldn't even spell it. Um, and they needed with somebody with cloud native experience to repurpose the assets from Gen 3 and make it deployable into a wildly different cloud environment from Gen 3's typical. Uh, so this is a, a little bit of a highlight of information uh, about Empower. It's a part of a much larger network, including the, the HEAL initiative just mentioned. So we are empowering that data sharing. Uh, in addition, we're rolling out uh, new data commons uh, very shortly to expand that internal network as well. All right. So let's talk a little bit of Gen3 architecture and take a peek underneath the hood. Uh, so the Gen3 architecture, it's a microservice architecture where all of our microservices are running on Kubernetes. The authorization and authentication is built on top of OpenID Connect, and then we have our own attributes-based policy engine. I was told it also support role-based uh, uh, policies. Uh, it's completely API driven and all of our assets live in different object storage services. Um, and then we also provide a graph like database for clinical or structural data, data that is uh, developed on top of Postgres. You can flatten that data into Elasticsearch for caching and faster queries, essentially. Um, I'm gonna talk really quickly about data architecture uh, in Gen3. Yeah, so there's three different types of data that you can have uh, host on Gen3 based on their structure. So one of them is unstructured data, which can be just file objects. Uh, that can be, for example, uh, biomedical imaging or genomic sequencing files. And then we also do structured data, which is data that follows a strict or specific schema. Uh, in Gen3, that is called data model or data dictionary. Uh, that is the data that is usually used for clinical or phenotypical data. And then the semi-structured data is essentially a metadata to describe data sets or provide additional metadata about samples within the clinical metadata. So here you see a visual representation of a graph, and uh, this is part of our data portal. Uh, this describes how a particular data common uh, organizes and describes its structured data. Um, data, when you submit it, is harmonized to fit the schema so that it'll be easier to do consistent searching across the, the clinical data. Then for the unstructured data, it can live in a variety of different you know, buckets and stuff. And then within Gen3, we mint a permanent digital ID called data GUID for each asset within Gen3. Um, it's made off of just a prefix that tells which comments that is hosting this data and then a UUID. Using this, we can support like trillions of GUIDs across uh, all Gen3 powered comments. Then we also built a uh, data format that can encompass like all of the data within a Gen3 data comment and create a snapshot of it. With that PFB file format, you can combine like clinical and structural metadata and into like a single file and you can export it to external system to enhance the interoperability or you can do backups. Uh, but yeah, PFB can also be extended to work with like fire or healthcare data. Okay, so a little bit about our cloud native journey. So we've been doing this for a few years, so I just want to go over a few of the challenges and the learnings that we've faced so far. Yeah. Okay, so for context, CTDS is managing about 30 different production environments, and they're all on AWS and EKS. Our short-term goal is to grow that into 200 comments, but those 200 is not just our comments, but also community-driven data comments. Um, 
Additional context, so the traditional way to deploy Gen3 onto uh, Kubernetes is we made a tool called Cloud Automation. It is essentially a monolithic uh, repository of DevOps tooling where we have bash scripts, the Kubernetes manifest, the Terraform. The idea was to abstract away a lot of these technologies for researchers, uh, but there are some proprietary concepts in there, kind of like an admin VM uh, is where you run all of the Gen3 commands from. Uh, this is a bastion host with a secure access to manage your data commons. Um, it's very uh, highly integrated to CTDSS use cases and very comprehensive, but it's also a barrier of entry for the community because there's a steep learning curve, first of all, and there is some proprietary concept that probably doesn't make sense to anyone, even if you've worked with Kubernetes before. Um, so yeah. Um, and that's how uh, Colin also started helping us out, being involved in the community, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so again, a little bit of background. Um, so cloud automation was tough, uh, Jawad is right. Uh, so we were working with Wake Forest, and they were working on a non-AWS uh, cloud provider. Very favorable agreements with uh, Google Cloud, so they want to continue to maintain that environment. Couldn't run Kubernetes to save their lives. Uh, they couldn't give us any idea of standardization or uh, compliance or any way to run those environments. Um, and when, we, uh, when they tried to actually run Gen 3, they couldn't use cloud automation. It just didn't work, and it, it was proprietary to AWS at the time. So at the time, Gen 3 required adopters to create the operational environment, uh, to configure, deploy, and maintain that environment itself, and then repurpose, configure, deploy, and maintain the Gen 3 data commons environment as well. So so complexity on complexity on complexity. But it's not a unique problem to the industry. So um, when we evaluated Gen3, we wanted to make sure it was a good fit, and it is. It's a great mature open source data commons project uh, built by researchers for researchers. Researchers know researchers best. Um, and it fits a good platform strategy for Viverse build. It's an interoperable platform that we can build on top of. Go ahead, advance. Um, these adoption challenges are really interesting, and it's a burden of responsibility for open source maintainers. You come out with a product that somebody wants to run in their infrastructure, and uh, it causes these unintended support challenges. Um, end users, we would think, have the environment ready and choose our tools with the environment and the infrastructure in mind, and then deploy those tools. In reality, they often work backwards. They say, what's a tool that can get me paid? How do I, like, what's an application that can do that? How do I run that? Where's the infrastructure? Um, so Gen 3 found themselves in that situation. Yeah. So how did that manifest in Gen 3? Adopters weren't ready for cloud native. Um, they were finding, uh, when we got uh, joined in on the project, Jawad was giving presentations and trainings on how to use Helm, how to run cloud automation, what's a Kubernetes cluster, how do you secure Kubernetes? And that's not what Gen 3 should be focused on. They should be focused on improving the data commons product. So go ahead. Um, so adoption challenges like that are everywhere. Again, they don't have, uh, many of our adopters don't have uh, cloud native expertise. So our considerations, we need to start architecting for portability and architecting for scalability and providing those assets to the end users so they can actually run and consume our applications. And so we consider uh, if we're thinking about platform strategy, we have a new user type there. The new user type is the adopters themselves. It's the IT operators, and it's the developers that need to build on top of extensible platforms and provide custom experiences. So how did Gen 3 start to tackle that? Yeah, I mentioned cloud automation where like our Kubernetes manifest were hidden behind bash scripts. It was AWS specific and it was uh, difficult to work for others that are non-CTS people. Uh, we also had a Docker Compose deployment, but it was uh, cumbersome and uh, hard to maintain. Uh, so that essentially led into the involvement of Gen 3's DevOps strategy. Uh, so we recognized that doing it in a monolithic way in cloud automation wasn't really working for everyone. It was also a barrier for us because we needed to grow our comments into 200. So we needed to adopt community standard tools uh, to add additional automation and free ourselves from the admin VM essentially. Um, so what we ended up doing is we adopted pure Helm for Kubernetes orchestration and then we take, took the Terraform out and made it a pure Terraform module. And then we are less opinionated about how to run them uh, and make that uh, more ambiguous uh, and up to uh, the community. Our goal is to enhance the community and the developer experience but also to add more automation as I said. 
And that's how we're architecting Gen3 to run everywhere. We have our Helm charts. We have a Gen3 umbrella Helm chart that encapsulates all of the microservice Helm charts. And then uh, we bundled that Gen3 umbrella chart with some development tooling as well. So it comes with Postgres, Elasticsearch, and Minio, so we can do streamline dev and CI operations. And we have a common chart that does, uh, you know, shared stuff. And a lot of the scripting that was done in cloud automation can be moved there, can be database setup jobs, and other shared functionality. And for infrastructure management, I mentioned we're using Terraform, obviously, because it gives us the reusability and repeatable infrastructure deployment. Um, and now we can also provide that as a reference architecture for the community to follow, because, um, yeah. And Building a platform around Terraform <laughs> added some challenges for us as well. Just keeping up with the Terraform upgrades and the state changes and the schema changes. Yeah, Ed over there has, it, it, yeah, he's amazing with Terraform and he's keeping us afloat. But ideally, like, we wanted to free ourselves from the admin VM so we could do pure Terraform work and not just build, like, a DevOps platform around it. So now we're doing Terragrunt and Atlantis with GitOps approach and hierarchical uh, management of all of our environments, which will help us grow uh, into 200 plus comments. Um, GitOps is uh, really, really important for us, and we've been doing that since 2018. Uh, Argo CD wasn't a thing back then, so we built our own way with, uh, with the CDs manifest and cloud automation repositories. It's very, very bespoke, and we just do like cron jobs to sync whatever configurations, and I think that runs once every hour or something. But now with Helm and Argo CD, we can do faster deployments and rely on the community to build these DevOps tools instead of us having to build them. And I mentioned Terraform and Atlantis. And yeah, yeah our focus should be on building research platforms, not DevOps tooling. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, another challenge for them was research compute. How do you scale to 50,000 nodes <laughs> when you need to yeah. run a complex data <laughs> workload? Right. So we have two different types of research compute within Gen3. We have our workspaces, which can be containerized uh, analysis environments. So they can be like notebooks, such as Jupyter or RStudio, or any other containerized application with a UI that we can mirror. Uh, the way it works under the hood, we have an orchestrator that basically spins up these containers, either in Kubernetes or in another cloud account using the AWS SDK. And then we basically use an Envoy proxy to mirror the UI back in a secure way back to the researchers. Another research computer is workflows. So in Gen3, we support Nextflow, and we also support running Argo workflows. Um, and one thing that we're doing with Argo workflows, which is really cool, is we're doing genome-wide association studies. Uh, that is a statistical tool where you can identify genes or genomic regions that are related to health and diseases. Um, a little bit more about our auto-scaling strategy, though. Like, we used to use Cluster Autoscaler, and in our environment, we, man we used Terraform to set up some auto-scaling groups, and then Cluster Autoscaler would kind of hook into those uh, auto-scaling groups. We had to kind of guesstimate the node sizes and types to fit all of our workloads, and we also ran into a few different issues uh, where, you know, you, you want to spin up a... Com yeah, anyway, we ran into a few issues. <laughs> yeah. We moved to Carpenter because that allows us to manage like all of our infrastructure and nodes directly from Kubernetes using CRDs. And with that, we could get the right size of nodes and we could choose between like a spectrum of node types. Also helped us move to spot, so it helped us cut a lot of cost. Uh, and we're also using Carpenter in a uh, cool way to do multi-tenant cost tracking. So I mentioned, mentioned the GWAS workflows. That spins up about 1,600 pods for each workflow, and those come out to about $50 each. We need to track those costs so we can offset them and like, get, get that back to the researchers. The way we did that is we used Carpenter in uh, combination with Argo events. Each time a workflow is triggered, we create specific nodes in AWS using CRD so that it's tagged with the workflow ID and the user ID so that we can rely on the native AWS cost and user report Report to generate the cost. And then that enables our, our FinOps team to create like payment models and stuff around, uh, around these workflows. Another thing that we've encountered is developer experience. And we are working hard to make that better. Traditionally, the way it worked is that we have a shared EKS cluster running cloud automation with a namespace for each developer. Developers would commit to GitHub 
uh, that would build their images and then they would roll the pods in the EKS cluster. Um, that is a slow development process and we wanted to move that a little bit more left in the development life cycle. And with the Helm charts, we can do that. The developers are now able to spin up Gen 3 directly on their laptops and we can build uh, or we can leverage tooling such as scaffold or tilt or dev space around to do like hot reloading of code. Um, and right now we're working on getting like Heroku-like ephemeral environments using Argo CD's uh, preview environments uh, thing. And we're also looking into building like an internal development portal for our developers to have all of the dev resources in there. And we're building a new front end uh, application or front end framework built on Next.js. So external uh, developers can also add in their own components for Gen 3 really easily. Yeah, yeah and I can take that. Yeah. So, but what about running Gen 3 in production? We always get asked, okay, what is it gonna take to run this in production? That's always the question. Go ahead. Yeah, so different organizations have different challenges. Like they, they, they wanna run it on different cloud providers or even on-premise, on OpenStack, we have people doing that. And they have different compliance requirements and they have different cloud maturity or practices within there. Um, and Gen 3 may or may not be deployed into a larger ecosystem, which is already part of something. Um, so we, we need to like set up a shared responsibility model where Gen 3 is not responsible to manage the infrastructure for people or secure their environment. What we can do is we can provide validated and secured uh, uh, artifacts that are tested. We can provide recommended tools and best practices. Uh, we can provide reference architecture and spec uh, specifications. We can have our APIs be um, interoperable and just in general provide a strong uh, data sure. commons experience. Yeah, and the shared responsibility model, I popularized by AWS, so perfect, um, is, is a great communication tool, if anything, to, to communicate where the responsibility lies between the consumer and the producer. Um, the CNCF uh, put out, a platforms working group put out a white paper. This is a diagram from that white paper. Um, and it's a good kind of architectural mapping tool that can help communicate what are the actual tools and capabilities your platform provides um, and helps communicate those tools back to your uh, adopters as well. I can tackle that too. Um, yeah, next. Yep. So if we take that um, and we repurpose it and turn it into an architecture or a planning tool, um, this is essentially what the core Gen 3 platform looks like in association with uh, the platform's working group artifacts to communicate where uh, different components and different CNCF um, ecosystem uh, products are used as a part of the encompassing platform. So this is an interoperable cooperative tool that works alongside other applications within a platform and doesn't necessarily need to function as a black box. That gives you some of that interoperability, that custom customizability, and lets you use the tool for more than it was originally purposed for. You'll notice that in some areas, if we communicate actively that that uh, for infrastructure or for messaging, for example, they might bring your own. You might need to select something there, but just communicating that is powerful as well. Next. So uh, tell us a little bit more about how CTDS makes customizations to their environment to better run their commons in particular. Right. So we use AWS for all of our underlying infrastructure. We use EKS for Kubernetes. Then we have OpenSearch to offset the Elasticsearch. We have S3 for our uh, object storage. We use Aurora Serverless for the Postgres. And then uh, Argo CD to do the deployments. Datadog for observability. And Prisma Cloud uh, and Cortex for security. And in Power at Wake Forest, we mentioned we're working on Google Cloud. And in fact, we're actually deploying data commons into multiple cloud provider environments. We're not just in Google. We want supplier diversity. Um, so again, we're running on GKE uh, for Kubernetes, uh, Google Cloud, obviously, for infrastructure. Uh, we use our own Elasticsearch instance and support that. Uh, we're also using Google Cloud Storage for S3 compatible object storage instead of using a Minio or instead of using S3 itself because we're not on AWS. Um, and we're using Cloud SQL for Postgres. So we're showing some of that customizability and that interoperability. We're reusing those existing tools. And if we think about that overall operational platform as a whole, we need to map the additional components that we're using to supplement and to support that environment. So we're actually using some additional tools as well from the ecosystem to make sure that this runs best for Empower. Uh, we're using Rancher as a, a Kubernetes orchestrator so that we can run those multiple cloud environments and create uh, new environments environments on the fly. It also gives us a great management plane. Uh, we're using Longhorn for storage. Uh, you can see uh, we're actually introducing NATs and using NATs for a number of different uh, data and ETL uh, workload, and a little bit of real-time and temporal data as well. 
Um, and we've actually exposed some additional interfaces for the researchers, including uh, direct access to Kibana uh, in some cases. But because Gen3 has developed with that core interoperable approach and is communicating how to include those other assets, it made it really, really easy for us um, as somebody supporting somebody else running the project to uh, secure the environment. Like we've introduced uh, uh, in-cluster security tool as well with compliance profiles to lock that down and do reporting. So we couldn't have done that if it wasn't interoperable, if it wasn't customizable. Um, and because of that, we can build on top of it. Yeah, and as Colleen mentioned, these are two very different operational environments, but uh, they run the same kind of uh, open data commons for different sort of research. Um, anyway, you can also get involved and help us cure cancer with Kubernetes. Uh, we want to have more deployment experience with other cloud providers, uh, if uh, it's not Google Cloud or AWS. Want to enhance the developer experience, and that's, there's a lot of cool tools in the CNCF landscape, uh, which my team here is to, uh, here to explore now. Uh, we can do uh, infrastructure and code en enhancement and build on top of the front-end framework uh, that I mentioned. Uh, e essentially, like, we want more institutions to join the uh, Gen 3 and democratize research. Uh, we have a few uh, community resources. We have our Slack, which you can get into by scanning that QR code um, or from our website. Uh, but we building a, re like a community around uh, any sort of platform is challenging, and we have limited staff, uh, so it's, Slack is a great tool for us to, to be able to uh, connect with the community and, and uh, foster a community that helps each other, yeah. and Colin is a proof of that, essentially. Uh, we're also doing bi-monthly webinars and uh, gonna start making more tutorials and stuff on, uh, on YouTube to make, make it more known. <laughs> yeah, so if you wanna learn more, go to gen3.org. Uh, you can uh, go to ctds.uchicago.edu to learn about the Center for Translational Data Science. And if you want to read the platform's white paper, you can find it on tagappdelivery.cncf.io. Perfect. All right. A little bit over time, but we can take any sort of questions. Heckle us. <laughs> I got two questions. Um, one is, why not the Galaxy Project? Like has the same kind of resources, the Helm, you know, uh, deployment for a single chart. Um, and, and two, does this integrate with other NIH, like data ecosystem stuff, like the GA4GA, uh, GA4GH uh, DRS service, or DRS model, or the C2M2 cross-cut metadata model? Um, yeah, I, I guess it's a supplemental thing to the Galaxy thing. I don't know what to uh, respond to that, but I think they, they might overlap in a very, like a variety of different uh, areas. For the DERS URI, I think uh, it's, I believe it's kind of based off of some of the technology. And we do work together with GA4, G8, and NIH and trying to give back to the community and, and build basically a open source research community. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Cool. Uh, hi. Um, sorry, relatively new joiner to the field of biotech, but what I noticed is that um, the whole ecosystem tends to have like its own set of tools for themselves. Um, people in my company uh, really like using uh, Cromwell as their uh, workflow engine. I noticed that you use the um, Argo CD workflows. Right. Um, how coupled is it? Um, it's, it's very optional. It's very optional. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we, we've just built a few workflows that work for us to do GWAS that we can run on Argo workflows. Um, and then we did the Carpenter thing on top to track the cost. If you wanted to run Cromwell, I'm sure you could do that on top of Gen3 data. Uh, as I mentioned, we have an SDK to pull in data or build on top of Gen3. So it's very possible, uh, whatever engine that you want to use, uh, to use it. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really important to, to highlight their open platform strategy there as well. It is designed to be interoperable and configurable, right? Everybody, especially research institutions, you're exactly right. They have their own customized tools. They have their own proprietary tools. And so they, we need to be supportive of that. And that's the idea is being able to provide that core platform experience that really serves the end users well, but allows the operators to enhance and improve those workflows by adding those additional tools. So very much taking an enhancement or an opt-in approach 
approach there as opposed to a closed ecosystem and do it our way. So those open APIs are really powerful there as well. But Argo isn't part of the core platform. It is part of uh, maybe the recommendations and examples of ways that you can run ETL workloads or do your CI CD or rule things out that way. Uh, we, we personally use Fleet in some of our applications as well for that, uh, just to demonstrate there. But we are also choosing to use Argo workflows as our uh, ETL engine of choice. One more question. Uh, is there a chance that we'll see uh, UK biobank data uh, on a Gen 3 uh, in deployment? I would love for that. I'm not sure if that's happening, but I, if that is happening, yeah, I would love for that to happen. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, one of the beautiful parts that hopefully they can uh, when we started the project and when things were a lot more manual, uh, it was challenging, but now we have a new, we can stand up a new data commons in about a minute and a half um, and just replicate, replicate, replicate. Uh, and that's amazing. All right. Thank you so much. Go.